coconut. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 400 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Stay tuned for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com just for Trek Geeks listeners. Fansets, our pins have character. This episode is also sponsored by Science Division, the makers of the galaxy's first interactive Tribble that you can control with your very own smartphone. See their limited edition giant silver Tribble available for pre-order today at sciencediv.com. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. Hey, this is Noah Averback Katz. That's Rin from Star Trek Discovery. And you are listening to the Emerald Chain's favorite show. That's right. Osira tunes in. Aurelio tunes in. Even Zareth wants to listen. It's the Trek Geeks podcast with Dan Davidson and Bill Smith. a holographic simulation of fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. It's the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant and the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Greetings to you guys, dolls, and pallies all over the galaxy, and welcome to the Trek Geeks Podcast. This is episode number 278, and we are so excited you're with us today. Of course, by we, I do mean my co-host and I. Yeah. You see, if he were in a holographic simulation of Las Vegas, um, I would hope that maybe the Vegas mob of that era would deal with the situation, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and that is to say they'd make him a dishwasher in their worst hotel on the strip. Um, he is the very menial and tedious Dan Davidson. And Dan, welcome aboard, buddy. Um, we're going back to Vegas, virtually. Crazy. Crazy. Crazy, baby. It's crazy, baby. It's great to be here. Yes, going back to Vegas. Uh, and 1962 Las Vegas, I think. So, yes, there probably are a lot of those mobsters out there who would do whatever they would do to me. But it's glad. I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you to talk about a great episode. It's always good to sit down with you, Bill, to talk Star Trek. Did you know that? I always enjoy it. I don't know if you always enjoy it, but I love it. It's fantastic. One one of these days, I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully today will be that day, because today we are going to talk about a great Season 7 Deep Space Nine episode. It's got a very uh, serious topic, but the, the episode itself is just fantastic. And that episode is, it's only a paper moon, uh, and we deal, or we watch Nog deal with his... Uh, post-traumatic stress of losing his leg after the siege of AR-558. So, great episode. Awesome story with him and Vic and the holodeck and, and Vegas, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm amazed that you could say all that, like, without looking at it written down or without messing it up. Didn't, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to say the wrong number. I'm going to say the wrong number. It's 558. 558. <laughs> <laughs> You've been rehearsing for a week. I have been. I have been. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, this is an episode that... Uh, that is really kind of tough to watch nowadays, um, especially considering, you know, that, that the fact that we lost Aaron not all that long ago, in, you know, realistically, still kind of stings. It does. It really does sting a lot. And it, at the same time, it makes this performance all that more enjoyable to watch, even though it's so hard, because this by far and away is the best Nog story. It's Aaron's best performance as Nog, even though all of his performances have been great. This one really focused on the character, and he hit a grand slam right out of the park on this one. So it's very sad that he's that he's gone. We're going to get into that, I'm sure, during our discussion. But uh, it's a fun episode. It's a great um, it's a great escape from the war in season seven, um, even though it is a series. Topic and there's a lot of great uh, comedic and uh, heartfelt moments in this episode. 
Absolutely. You know, this is one of the things that Deep Space Nine excelled at throughout its run, is that they found ways to tell these great stories outside of the Dominion War, even though the Dominion War was still a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Star Trek Discovery has gotten a little better at this particular task with some of these one-off stories. But, I mean, if, if you need a textbook on how to do it, I tell you, Deep Space Nine really is it. Because between this and episodes like Take Me Out to the Hollow Suites and, yeah. and other ones, they really just find a way to still do Star Trek amid war. Yeah, absolutely. And the other one that pops into mind is also a Vic uh, Vegas story, and that's Bada Bing, Bada Bang. That's another great one that yeah. kind of gets our mind off everything, and there's a lot of great stuff that happens in that. So yeah, good episode that we're going to be talking about, and it's one that we've wanted to talk about for a while, um, and now we're finally getting to do it. So I'm really excited, man. I am too, despite the fact that I'm talking about it with you. But first, <laughs> we're going to do a little business with the galaxy, and we'll be right back. Dan, as we do on every episode of Trek Geeks, it's time to talk about our good friends at Fansets. Each and every month, they have new and exciting pins to add to your collection. And as you might have guessed, this month is no exception. No, new and exciting, both at the same time. It's fantastic. Like the, like the love boat. Exactly. Or like my co-host. It's absolutely great. Um, as we talked about last episode, Bill, Mission Chicago is right around the corner, and Fansets is going to have three special edition pins to commemorate this convention. Uh, and if there are any pins left after the convention, which I kind of hope there isn't, because that means they'll sell out, which is always a good thing for Fansets, they are going to have them available at fansets.com for anybody who is not going to Chicago. Um, but before that big event in the Windy City, Fansets will have three additional pins on their site starting on March 15th, and they are Loxana Troy, Adira in their Earth Defense Force uniform, and Lieutenant Junior Grade Matt the Beluga Whale, or whatever he is, from Star Trek Lower Decks. <laughs> He, I, I believe he is a beluga whale, okay. and that is, um, that is awesome, Dan. That's six new pins coming out in the next few weeks, and I just, I, I I'm gonna have to whip out my credit card, and so should everybody else. You know what I'm gonna say? Head on over to fansets.com, grab a whole bunch of pins and some accessories, and maybe a gift card or two. Put those things in your cart, and then at checkout, be sure to enter this week's special discount code word, NOG. That's N O G in all capital letters for ten percent off your entire order. Now, this offer code will be good until March 23rd, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Plus, don't forget that when you spend more than 30 bucks at Fansets.com, you will automatically get free shipping in the United States. Free shipping with $30 off? Or $30 spent? I forgot. Yeah, you spent I, 30 bucks, free shipping. Huh, I forgot. I Fan tell you not to forget. Sorry. Fansets. Our pins have character. And we thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. So if you haven't checked out the Galaxy's first interactive triple from Science Division, then I got to say, you are really missing out. And you're behind the times. Let's go. Let's go. Get on it, people. This officially licensed triple is, is just an amazing high quality Star Trek collectible, which we know you're going to be proud to add to your collection. We each have one and we love our tribbles. So much work and creativity went into creating this Tribble, too, right down to the softest fur you can possibly imagine. Plus, I mean, let's be honest, the Tribble makes sounds straight out of the original series. You're going to swear that this thing was delivered straight from Space Station K7 right to your door. And guess what? They're going to be at Mission Chicago. They are. They're going to be at Mission Chicago. Plus, the Science Division Tribble has its own app that you can actually use to control the Tribble. It's not necessary, but I got to tell you, it's a lot of fun to make them scream at people like annoying podcast co-hosts. Uh, fret not, however, everyone except Bill knows this. You guessed it. That's right. <laughs> Tribbles are not dangerous, Bill. <laughs> that, that, they're not? Did you forget? I forgot the fan sets thing, so you can forget wow. that. Yeah. Wow, yeah, we must be getting older. Head on over to ScienceDIV.com right now to pick up one of the Galaxy's first interactive dribbles for your very own. Plus, while you're there, check out their new and improved shop accessory section where you can get all kinds of Science Division swag, like t-shirts and mugs, or even ye old legendary Science Division tote bag of holding, Dan. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. And we thank our friends at Science Division for sponsoring this week's episode. Hi, Dr. Phil Flox, also known as John Billingsley, speaking. I am the president of the board of the Hollywood Food Coalition. We serve terrific multi-course meals to the unhoused and to those in need seven nights a week. 
We assist as many as 100 nonprofits with their food needs, buttressing, extraordinary social service programs. We work with community partners to address issues of food insecurity here in SoCal. We do lots of other great stuff, but how much time do we have? If you're in L.A., come and volunteer with us at hofoco.org slash volunteer. And any Federation credits you can spare go a long way. Well, Dan, here we are. We've wanted to talk about this episode many times in the past, and somehow it either loses itself on the schedule or... You know, we wind up getting the chance to talk to somebody from Star Trek that we never would have thought we'd be able to talk to. And so the schedule changes and it gets rearranged. And and finally, you and I have decided, you know what, it's time to talk about this episode because um, it, it it really is, is that special. And of course, I'm talking about the season seven Deep Space Nine episode, It's Only a Paper Moon, which I know is one of your personal favorites. It is one of my personal favorites. It's a it's a remarkable episode, and and it's got you know uh, not to start off melancholy, but it's it means so much more now that Aaron's gone, um, it, for me anyway. It, it was I, when I rewatched it for this recording, I was I was bummed out. It really was it really was too bad, and and this by far is Aaron's longest and best performance as Nog in the entire series. And uh, it, he does such a great job and, and tackles a variety of different things in this episode. And I'm glad that we finally have been able to sit down and actually do an episode on a, an, on a, um, a story that is, is so remarkable. Well, you know, I, I think it came to mind when we talked to Armin a few episodes ago um, about, you know, Aaron's work and, and the relationship that they shared and well, let, let's unpack this now, and so that way we can yeah. we can carry on with the episode. But I watched myself today, and I have to admit, I did find myself a little bit sad. It was different than, like, say, the first time I watched Wrath of Khan after Leonard Nimoy died. Mm -hmm. um, I I I feel like I felt this loss a little more um, acutely, simply just because of how unique Aaron was in in as far as the Star Trek cast. Yeah, you know, he was a guy who. Uh, clearly had had some 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 medical issues growing up he'd been through a transplant he'd been through another transplant and then we lost him rather suddenly um watching this episode and, and seeing him get a chance to carry this as nog it warmed my heart and it broke my heart at the same time if that makes sense yeah it makes perfect sense and and i i felt the same thing it, it's great to watch something like this because and it's it's sad at the same time because you could see the potential that the character of Nog had all through the series, but then you saw exactly what Nog was like with this specific episode and how great a job Aaron did portraying Nog. But at the same time, I got to say, man, for, and a spoiler alert for those who haven't seen what we left behind, I was a little aggravated that in the you know the pretend season eight that they were working on that they kill Nog off in the first episode and when the Defiant gets destroyed. And it's just like, it's like, oh my God. And, and the reaction that, that, that Aaron gave during the documentary was, was justified. And it kind of made me a little, a little irritated that as we've talked about biggest character arc in the series, maybe in Star Trek as a whole. And that was going to happen to him, but it doesn't take away from what he did in this episode. That's for sure. No, no it doesn't, but I think it made that, that plot point for a theoretical season eight far, far more impactful. Oh yeah. Because Nog had the development that he had. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, <laughs> if it, I was it, Aaron, it, I would have that reaction too. It's like, you know, how many times have we talked about back when DS9 was on the air, they didn't have this, this walking dead or, or game of Thrones mentality where the top billing character could die at any moment. And then the first thing that we see in this theoretical season eight is Captain Nog on the Defiant getting destroyed. <laughs> it's, it's like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it really shell shocked me. But going back to, to Paper Moon, and this is an instance where, and it, this is rare in Star Trek, mm -hmm. where characters who aren't main characters yeah. carry the bulk of the episode. You got Aaron Eisenberg, of course, as Nog, and the incredible Jimmy Darren. As Vic Fontaine, I I love Jimmy Darren. He's awesome. I loved him in in the Gidget movies back in the day. I loved him in T.J. Hooker. I loved him in was it the Time Tunnel? Was he in that? I'm pretty sure. I don't think I've seen that one. Uh, it's one of the old Irwin Allen shows. Yeah, that Fansets does pins for. By the way, mm -hmm. yep. Um, but Plug. At, hey, thank you. It's, <laughs> I'm a pro, baby. You are. I couldn't have um, done that. 
But seeing him as Vic Fontaine and coming to Star Trek really was fantastic. And the way they built it in, because they got to use Jimmy's natural God-given talent. Mm-hmm. You believe in that sort of thing. I, I do. And and I love how, you know, we're getting off track about the Aaron story, but one of the things I love about what they did with Vic is he's a self-aware hologram. He knows he's a hologram. They make it Vegas. He acts Vegas. He oozes Vegas all the time. Of course, that's what his character is supposed to do. But Jimmy is so natural at doing that. Um, and, and I'll tell you what, when I hear some of the songs by the originals like Sinatra, Sinatra, excuse me, I don't know where that Sinatra came from. Sinatra. Sinatra. I think I was trying to take a breath at the same time. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I I hear Jimmy's version instead. Really? Yes. Um, a perfect example is the one um, when Odo and, and Kira kiss for the first time, and I can't think of the song right now because there were so many songs going on in this episode, but yeah, um, I do. I hear I hear him instead of, instead of Frankie. Isn't that weird? That's weird. It, it is weird to me. Well, see, the... The way I grew up, I mean, I grew up with older parents. So my parents were born in 1929 and 1931, respectively. So they were children during World War II. Mm -hmm. And as adults, they listened to, and we lived in the Lakes region of central New Hampshire, they listened to a small AM station called WASR, 1420 AM on the dial. And they played nothing but those standards from from that era. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up listening to those. Right. I've been listening to, you know, Sinatra and Martin and Sammy and and all of those big band singers and all of those, that band music my entire life. So when I heard this in an episode, I'm like, oh, I love Jimmy Darren's take on this because I love this song. Mm-hmm. To me, it was just another version. But it's interesting to hear your perception there because to you, that's Jimmy's song. And it, it may be because I, like you, I love listening to Frank Sinatra and, I, and Dean Martin. Oh, my God, I love Dean Martin. But oh. I'm usually listening to them during the holiday season, during doing their holiday songs instead of a lot of the stuff that they're so well known for that are not sure. holiday versions. So when I do hear them singing these songs, it's it's few and far between. But I've heard Jimmy sing them all the time because I've watched DS Nine so much. So yeah, to me those songs are Jimmy instead of Sinatra or whomever, which is that's which, amazing. I mean, I'm not trying to step on the toes of of the great of the greatest of the greats like Sinatra, but but yeah, Jimmy's pretty, Jimmy holds his own, baby. I'm sure the fans of Francis Albert Sinatra will have some words for you. (laughs) I'm sure. Um, At the center of this story, we have really an alarming tale of, you know, post-traumatic stress. Absolutely. Of, of, you know, somebody in, in, in deep need of therapy, of somebody in deep need of recovery. And when Nog comes back to Deep Space Nine, I mean, I don't want to state the obvious, but it is clear that he he is in a very very bad way very bad very dark very i you know everybody of course it's it's awkward i mean what do you do you know this guy just got back he lost his leg and but they're trying to trying to be nice but he just he doesn't want any part of it and yeah and it's you know i i gotta say i remember when first watching this and not really unfortunately because of the state of the world back then we're still learning how to deal with mental illness and coping with things like like uh post-traumatic stress i'm like wow he's being a real jerk what's his problem everybody's trying to help him come on now of course i got a different take on it i'm a lot older i understand things a lot better um but yeah he's he's hurting a lot and it's uh it's 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 apparent to you would think most people, but to some people it isn't. I'm a little concerned that it's not apparent to the people who are closest to him. Jake. Um, <laughs> well, not just Jake, but I mean, Rom. I mean, granted, all right, Rom's an idiot. He couldn't <laughs> fix a straw if it were bent. We know. <laughs> but it's his dad. Yeah. You know, or maybe, I don't know, Esri. My son's the crazy. counselor. Yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, one-legged crazy one-legged man. One-legged crazy man. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> which, is, which is hilarious and terrible all at the yes, same time. Yes, it is, yeah. Um, but it, it alarms me that, you know, nobody is alarmed. The thing I appreciate is that they all want to give him time to work through it, mm-hmm. which is something that I really think that as, as, as a society, we're starting to figure out now. We're not great at it as a right. society now. Yeah. But- but back then in the 90s, Ron Moore had enough presence of mind to say, no, I think these people would kind of love him through this. And that that really spoke to me. 
I agree. Um, I think it's interesting you pointed out some of the people that should know the most about how much he's hurting and be able to do it don't. And and you said it very quickly, Esri. I was very shocked at the way that she reacted to not only um, things that Nog was saying, but that other people were saying, like Vic. I mean, yeah, Vic's a hologram or whatever, but you know what? It was wor- It's working. The whole idea of he's got to come out to reality at some point is people need time. Um, every, everybody's always said, take all the time you need. People say that to everybody. People say, you've said it to me. I've said it to you. Yep. It, it seems for some reason, all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, nope, no more time. Got to get out of the holodeck. Shut it down. Now, in hindsight, that's exactly what Nog needed. But the way that Vic did it, I think was better than, let's say, how Esri would have done it. But yeah, it, I found it interesting even that his counselor was, was, was questioning what type of therapy was best for him. Uh, when seeing results of what was going on was very, very clear. Well, the thing that gets me is that the Deep Space Nine computer has a better method of treatment and plan than the station counselor does. Now, I get it. Esri Dax is young. This is her first assignment in space. It's probably her first time being a, a counselor professionally. But the computer, through Vic Fontaine, figures out what Nog needs and then helps him through it, which yeah. really is kind of... It, to me, it's the beauty of this episode, and it's the flaw of this episode, if that makes sense. Oh, I've never looked at it like a flaw, but yeah, I can see how I can see how you're right there. I like that. That's a good way to look at it, different way to look at it. You know, because I, I cause, you know, the, the computer is really just an amalgam of, of ones and zeros, right? And through this different program, Vic sort of comes up with this, well, I'll get him off the cane. Yeah, yeah. I got this. Yeah. It works, but really at the end of the day, what's happened is the Deep Space Nine computer has gotten Nog off the cane. Do you think that it's the DS9 computer or is it the program that was designed by Bashir's friend that had, that was a very distinct hologram? Do you think that the, the I think it's a little computer? column A, a little column okay. B. The computer's still running it. Yeah. Okay. You know, the computer's still taking into account the changes and the, and, and adapting the program to fit as any hollow deck or hollow suite program would. But at the end of the day, we have an AI as part of you're running in a, in a memory space in a computer deciding how to help this uh, humanoid. And that really, to me, like I said, is it's the blessing and the curse of this episode. It's find it, I find it interesting that this program of Vic can shut himself off and not turn on if he doesn't want to be turned on. That was very interesting and a little, a little disconcerting, Zora, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it says that he's always running. That's because if sp- if he can decide when he wants to come out to play, that means he is always on, he's always listening. Which it's is like, kind of, like which the is Amazon kind of, device over my shoulder. Yeah, which is kind of interesting because he says how great it was to be able to be running all the time for the first time since he could remember. Because he would only, you know, be turned on to play a few songs on stage and then he would shut down. Now he's running, he's sleeping, he's dreaming, he's helping with the casino uh uh redesign and everything like that but yes he is always on if he knows not to come on when he doesn't want to then he has to be on he has oh to be on. boy yep big brother's always big big darren big jimmy darren <laughs> <laughs> you know, people want to people want to talk about you know google and, and, and <laughs> siri and and i'm not going to say the amazon one because she's right over my shoulder right. and she's going to speak up <laughs> but a l e x a um but you know, here the Deep Space Nine Hollow Suite is essentially doing the same thing. And so that makes me wonder um, what some of Quark's customers um, <laughs> have documented now. <laughs> you haven't changed your you haven't changed your Alexa to say computer like we have? No, because my wife doesn't watch Star Trek. So <laughs> and <laughs> so she is the boss, so I guess okay. I'll talk to her. Well, it's not that she's the boss, but I I think that <laughs> Since she's not a Star Trek fan, she wouldn't really find the novelty in going, hello, computer. Well, I don't necessarily say it's because of Star Trek, Bill. Maybe so that you can say the word without it sending things off. So I'm trying to help. Let me recount the conversation (laughs) for you. Me. Hey, honey, did you know that we could actually rename the Amazon device to computer? She's her. That's dumb. Why would you want to do that? (laughs) Who picked computer? Oh, boy. And then you kind of have to tell the story. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do that. 
Okay. It's that simple. Case closed. Moving right along, Your Honor. <laughs> Moving right along. So so Nog yeah. you know, escapes. I and mean it's a he great uses, escape. He uses the hollow suite as yeah. as therapy, but essentially he's in, employing, at least in my opinion, some sort of escapism to avoid dealing with the real world. I agree with that, but at the same time it works. He and as well, I'm sure we're going to get into the scene where he spills his guts to to Vic yeah, about how yeah. he's really feeling. But it works. He loses the limp. He doesn't need the cane. He's not trying to, but he does because the therapy that he has decided to use for himself, as the, with the holodeck and being in that escape world, works. But it only works because the computer through Vic gives him tough love. Nog was content to stay in there for as long as he could forever that is if he would yes. have. Yep. Yep. But it doesn't work and he doesn't get the shock back to his system to go back to reality until Vic says, you are out of here. Right. I, I, and I, I totally agree with that. But the little steps that he makes along the way yeah. are, are good examples that that was working. But you, you're absolutely right. He couldn't stay in there forever. I mean, he would have turned into Barkley for God's sake. I mean, we, and, and that's, you know. That's neither here nor there, but I think that having, I, 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 for one, if I was going through some kind of therapy, I would love a holodeck. It, because yeah. a lot of people, I mean, when I was going through my tough times, there's nothing, I use Star Trek as my escapism, as my escape thing. He has the ability to put himself in a whole other world to help him cope. Even though he's not coping, he's kind of, you know, pushing it aside. But there are little steps that take place while he's in there. For example, the limp and the cane that that it shows that it is all psychological, which he said he didn't think it was at the beginning of the episode. But the doctors all said it did because when he wasn't thinking about it in the holodeck, he didn't limp, didn't use a cane. Well, and if you think about it in a way, for the last two years, we've all been using a holodeck of sorts. True to escape from the realities of a global pandemic. Absolutely. Whether it's Netflix and chill or Hulu and chill or Paramount Plus and chill. You know, a lot of us have been just sort of star trekking the last two years away. Mm -hmm. And and really it's it it's not all that different to me. I know that's what I've been doing. Yeah. I've watched more Star Trek and more episodes of The Office in the last two years than I ever have in my life. Why? Because it's it's comfort to me. It's something right. that I can control. It's something that I know what it is time and again. And in a way, Nog has really kind of done the same thing, you know, hold up in 1950s or 60s Las Vegas, watching old movies like Shane and figuring out how to run a casino. And as you said, the difference between us and Nog is we know when to, quote, turn it off and get back to the real world, whereas he Do didn't it. want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, um, it's it's an interesting, I, it's, it's one, of, this is one of these episodes that you can have a great, like, remember back in the day in high school, you have the debate club, the debate team. This mm. would be a great episode to have a pro holodeck for therapy versus anti-holodeck for therapy. I think that would be a great discussion. I do too. Uh, you know, it, some could argue, I'm glad I don't have a VR headset be, or I'm yeah. glad Second Life isn't still a thing. <laughs> 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 but, you know, it, you talked about that scene where, you know, Vic essentially says, you know, um, you got to go. Mm -hmm. And and Nog says, don't you get it? I can't go out there. Yeah. And we talked about this, you know, before we started this segment of the show, I have some of those feelings. You know, as I start to venture back into the world after this global pandemic that I referenced, um, I've had moments where I'm like, I, I can't go out there. Yeah. And I say to myself, well, why can't I go out there? And I feel the exact same way at times, not this moment, that Nog has because he's scared. Anxiety. Because, and here's what Nog says. He goes, when the war began, I wasn't happy or anything, but I was eager. I wanted to test myself. I wanted to prove I had what it took to be a soldier. And I saw a lot of combat. I saw a lot of people get hurt. I saw a lot of people die, but I didn't think anything was going to happen to me. And then suddenly Dr. Bashir is telling me he's got, I, got to cut my leg off. I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. If I can get shot, if I can lose my leg, anything could happen to me, Vic. I could die tomorrow. I don't know if I'm ready to face that. If I stay here, at least I know what the future is going to be like. And I think that 
at various points over the last two years really kind of sums up my feelings about trying to reintegrate to society. Um, it's scary. Don't you, we think, don't you think that at some point, even in regular life, that's the case too? None of us know what the future is going to be like. But and and I'm not saying this to I'm not saying this that I yeah. to say that I don't agree with them. I 100 percent right. agree with them. When you've got a traumatic issue as losing your leg and being involved in a war, I can only imagine that. I, I no, I'm sorry, I can't imagine what that feeling is like. Yeah. And and I give credit to all the heroes in the armed forces and and other ways of life that have that have gone through this type of of thing, um, and come back good on the other side. They didn't have a holodeck to go hide in and, and, and get no. healed. They were able to do it, you know, through, through the ways that they were able to do it. But, um, it, yeah, it's, it's scary. And, and I totally agree with what you're saying with, with the pandemic and, and getting back to, to real life. I mean, cause we're going to be doing that in 30 days when we start heading up yeah. to Chicago for the convention. And it's, it's going to be the first time really doing something like that. I've been to Disney, which is a little bit different. You haven't been anywhere. I mean, anyway. we're going to be like in, we're going to be in the middle of like a sea of people uh, all getting together for the first time in a couple of years. And it, it doesn't generate anxiety for me. There are ways in which I'm really looking forward to it, but there are other ways where it's like, okay, I haven't done this in a while. I don't know if I remember how to people, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if I, it's a little scary. Obviously, it's completely different, but I understand where Nog is coming from in that thing where if I stay here in my bubble, nothing can hurt me. Nothing can get me sick. Nothing can impact my life. But the line that Vic has after that is is really the one that makes me, you know, get up and want to go to Chicago. It's like, you stay here, you're going to die. You know, not all at once, but little by little, and eventually you'll become as hollow as I am. And that really is the salient line of that scene. Yeah. Vic... Vic slash the computer is 100% right. He's going to lose a little bit of himself every single day. Um, if he stays where he is, he's gotta, he's gotta go back. Compared to you kid, I'm as hollow as a snare drum. Great line. And and he's right. Um, one of the things that I find interesting and I want to get your take on it with regards to Nog is at the beginning of the episode, when he gets off the, off the transport, you can see that he's, he's not. Great. And then, of course, he just lays in bed and listens to the song the whole time. Then he starts going in the holodeck and he starts becoming more himself and he looks like he's having fun. I found it amazing how fast the shields went up and the the distant, not caring Nog appeared as soon as anybody from the real world walked into Vix. That scene with Jake and his date was like, wow. I mean, talk about a snap of the fingers change in how your demeanor is simply because he didn't want to be dealing with anybody in the real world at all. It was the snap back of the rubber band. Absolutely. You know? yep. um, it, it was that anchor to his real life. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously he and Jake have a brotherhood. You know, he and Jake have this bond, you know, and this love for each other that that's obvious. But Jake walking into Vix is like a, a, a smack in the face. Like, oh yeah, there's something else outside of yeah. you. And I get that. Yep. Um, it, it's like seeing you. It's a real smack in the face. I, and I'm, I'd be happy when I see you in person to smack you in the face. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you saw it again later, a little toned down, but when Nog and Lita, uh, or I'm sorry, when um, Ram and Lita came in. And he was having a great time. He was, you know, you know, schmoozing with the guests. And then he's talking to his parents and, and they say that all these things have been going on out in the real world, like the party, um, for, uh, what was it? Somebody, uh, Rom got, Rom got Rom. promoted and they had a party and, and, and Nog was like, oh, oh, okay. So you can kind of see a little bit of that shell cracking that he's missing out on things that he normally would like to be a part of. Um, but it, it, it Vic had to do what he did. Um, when he shut down the computer, mm-hmm. that had to happen. Um, and I'm, I'm glad it did. Uh, well, I think it's more impactful coming from Vic because yeah. that's where Nox, Nog sought solace. Right. If Cisco had walked through the door and ordered Nog to come mm-hmm. back, Nog would have resigned his commission. Exactly. And like he said, if, if uh, when Esri... Esri was in there and, and, and said, if you make me leave, I'll resign. So yeah, absolutely. It would have, it would have backfired. Um let me let me ask you a quick question. Yeah. What's your favorite scene of this episode? Ooh, that's tough. Um because there there's so many of the scenes that I appreciate for very different reasons. 
Um, I, I want to say it's when Vic finally convinces Nog to do the books because it goes back to the Ferengi in him mm -hmm. where he has to have that sort of moment of self-actualization to go, I can do this. Yeah. I don't need a computer. Just give me the pencil. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's sort of the last domino to fall on Nog's recovery. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the scene I appreciate the most. I like that scene. And one of the things based on that scene, before I get to my favorite scene, I love what the production staff of, of Deep Space Nine did for this episode. The wardrobe, the decor of, of the hotel. Yeah. It is so great. This, I mean, the sweater that, that, that he's wearing. And, oh, my God. It's just so awful, but so great. So 60s. Um, I really like what they did. The big TV, the tube, the TV in black and white. Shane was filmed in color, interestingly enough. But he's watching it in black and white because color television wasn't around back then. Which I thought That's was right. very interesting. That's right. That um, movie would have been broadcast on any one of a number of like, you know, VHF stations, or yeah. UHF stations yep. in black and white. And so, yeah, it, come back, Shane. <laughs> so my favorite scene, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if favorite scene is the right word, but the scene that got me the most was the flashback scene. Because it wasn't a flashback to something we saw in the episode Siege of AR-558. They right. did a whole scene as a flashback. And he's laying on that table with his le his leg is gone. You see him with a blanket over him. But that part of where his leg usually is, is flat. And that was a real, like, holy bleak moment for me. And, you know, of course, that's what the, you know, I'll be seeing you song first comes from and everything, which I love. That scene to me, and of course, of course, Quark, who was always the pain in the butt to everybody, is the guy that's standing at the end of Nog's bed. I thought that was great. I thought it was a great way to tie it all together. Yeah. Uh, we've come this far without mentioning sort of the, the creatives of this episode. Yeah. So, um, this episode written by Ronald D. Moore, the great Ronald D. Moore, mm -hmm. who has written so many great Star Trek stories and, of course, gone on to so many amazing things. From a story by David Mack. Yes. And John Ordover, who both worked on the books uh, and co uh, they co-wrote one of their episodes. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I got it right here. Let me, you keep talking. I'll find, it. I got it right here. I just remember seeing it a little while ago. And of course this episode directed by Anson Williams, who of course is famous or legendary yep. for playing Potsy on yes. Happy Days. Amazing. And the other episode that they helped write was Starship Down. Another great episode. That's right. Oh, I yep. love that episode. So. Very good episode. Yep. But, but amazing, amazing name. David Mack, of course, is my favorite author. My all time favorite Star Trek book is written by David Mack and, and, um, uh, yeah, just it, it's a great story. It, it really is a great story. And to think all the things that you know that 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 these authors and writers and directors have done for science fiction, this is not a science fiction story by any stretch of the imagination. No, it's a it's a heart story, and that and that's one of the things that I find so intriguing about it. Well, I mean, Star Trek and the best of Star Trek always speaks to humanity, and it speaks to the things that make us who we are. In this episode does a really great job of that. Yep. You know, I, I see things, you know, before Nog sort of starts recovering, I, I see things in Nog that I saw in my own father when he had his leg amputated as a result of diabetes. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the cane, you know, the, the ghost feelings that weren't really there and how they yep. were, at least in my father's case, very psychological. You know, I, I seeing that, it, it recalled very vivid memories of a time... 35 years ago when, when that happened, yeah. you know, I have to, all the credit in the world to Aaron Eisenberg for the way he portrayed that, because to me, it was 100% believable as the family member of someone who has lost a limb like that. It's interesting. I don't know. I, I haven't done any reading up to see what type of research he did to portray someone who's going through this uh, post-traumatic stress. But I do know that several, um, uh, combat veterans and people that have dealt with it got in touch with him after this episode originally aired to yeah. tell him how spot on he was with his portrayal of it. And that's a credit to his, to what his acting ability was like. Uh, I'm sure he did some research on it, but, but it, that's, there's a lot of heartfelt stuff in there that uh, he just, uh, he just does so, so well. You know, the best compliment we could possibly give Aaron Eisenberg, whether he's with us or not, is that he carried the weight of an entire Star Trek episode on his mm -hmm. back. Yep. And you know what? He delivered. He did. It is by far his best performance 
in all of Star Trek. Now, granted, that's not to say that the other ones were bad. I mean, but you get the most, the highest concentration of Nog in this episode Mm -hmm. and Aaron delivers in every single scene. He is magnificent. He really is. I mean, I mean, the, I think he's in one of the first scenes that we ever see on the station when he's like going, crawling around with, with, uh, I don't know if it was Jake or somebody who's just crawling around, you know, broken pieces of, of, of rooms and stuff like that is just this young kid. And then he, we see him, you know, just evolve working at the bar, wanting to join Starfleet and Cisco thinking it's a big joke. And then he finally gets into Starfleet because he doesn't want to end up like his father. Like I said, biggest character arc. He goes into battle. He loses his leg. He has this episode. And then it continues on for the remaining few episodes left in the series where he is he is a Starfleet officer through and through. He gets a promotion. One of Cisco's last acts as captain of the station was to promote him. It makes you really wish, notwithstanding what we talked about, about the the pretend season eight that they could have worked on, if the series had continued without that cliffhanger or, or death of, of Nog, what else we could have seen with this character? Now, I know there are the books and everything like that, but I, I, it's a great character that could be built upon if if they had decided to do that back in the day. It is really a great character and honestly, one of Star Trek's greatest, you know. When Armin was on, he talked about, you know, how the Ferengi really kind of got messed up at the beginning and he made it kind of his personal mission to to sort of correct that. Mm-hmm. Well, between him and Max Gredenchik and Aaron Eisenberg, they not only did it, they they really kind of set a, 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 they set the bar very high for anyone who might portray a Ferengi in the future, quite frankly. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and no spoilers or anything, but for anybody who hasn't watched Discovery or, or Picard or anything like that, who would have thought that if you would just watch the last outpost for the first time and you're like, what the heck are these things? This is a joke. They are a huge part of the Feder, well, not maybe the Federation, but a huge part of Discovery. We get to see Ferengi 900 years in the future. They're still an important part of of what's going on in the Star Trek universe. And you're absolutely right. It is 100% because of Armin and Aaron and Max. And, and got to give them all the credit in the world for what they do. And it's stories like this that it doesn't matter if you're an alien or not. You still got a heart. You still feel. You still have stress. You still have uh, all the different things that humans have for emotions. Now, this is an episode that takes place over a couple of months. Yeah. At least. Because mm-hmm. that's, that's referenced in the episode. Yep. And so... You know, here we are, season seven, you know, we're in the last season of Deep Space Nine, we're in the throes of the Dominion War, Mm -hmm. and Deep Space Nine, you know, hats off to Ira and to Ron Moore, because they found a way to tell a really personal story that had nothing to do with the Dominion War Right. in the middle of the Dominion War. And it seemed to be at a point because they showed the outside of the station a couple of times and there was nothing really bad going on. There were a couple of ships docked. There was a there was an Excelsior class at one of the top pylons at one yeah. point in one of the opening scenes. So it was a nice quiet time in the middle of the war, which I think is great that they were able to do because there's times – I mean, unfortunately, we're seeing it right now. I'm sure that there's times during the war that we're seeing in Ukraine where things might be quiet in a certain area. That doesn't mean the war's not going on, because it is. And that's another thing that I liked. We didn't have to worry about what was going on in the war with this episode. Cisco was dealing with that off camera, or Bashir was helping patients somewhere else, and or Brian was doing his thing. This was a sole focus which was needed in the middle of the war to, t- to help us take our minds off the war. If you want to look at it that way. I think that's actually the point, quite yeah. frankly, you know, you hardly see Cisco or Kira or Odo or O'Brien. <laughs> you, you hardly see Esri, you hardly see Bashir, but you don't miss them in this episode. Yeah. You see little bits here and there, but the, the times where they are in the episode, it, it actually matters in the scope of the story. I think it's done very well. They could have not had those characters in this episode at all, and I still think it would have been stellar. I think so, too. I think, as a matter of fact, I think Kira and Odo, aren't they only in the first scene in the doctor? They're only in the teaser, yeah. And I love it how Odo's like, oh, I think they were forged. (laughs) His orders of R&R, I thought that was a great Odo line. But yeah, you don't see them again the rest of the episode. I think you do see, do you see them in the the wardroom when they're talking about what to do, or is it just, uh, just Kira? Or is Kira even there? Kira's not even in the wardrobe. Kira's not even there. It's just Bashir and uh, and Jake and Ezri. Yeah. yeah I yeah. don't, I guess Jake is there because he's Nog's best friend mm-hmm. and Rom and Lita are there because they're the, you know, the parental units yeah. 
Um, but other than that, I mean, it's there's no <laughs> there's no Brian in that scene either. That's right. Since we're talking about that scene, I think it's great how Bashir gets digged on every one of his programs. Oh yeah, one after the other. I thought that was a great comedic moment of the episode. It's like let's just pile on Julian. <laughs> hey, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm right here. <laughs> And you do that to me all the time, so I know exactly Seriously. how he feels. Well, it, you know, all I can think of now is Sid playing his Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And Absolutely. we've come full circle. Absolutely. Wow. Well, you know, this is this is not an episode I rewatch often because there's yeah. an emotional investment. And especially now, you know, because Aaron is no longer with us. Yeah. It's I, I put it on today. I actually watched it back to back. Mm-hmm. And I, after the first time, it was like, oh, man. Mm-hmm. After the second time, it was, damn, that was good, but oh, man. Yeah. But it, it's kind of like I, I, the way I reserve watching Star Trek Two because of Leonard. I kind of feel that way about this particular episode. I'm not going to rewatch this like a lot, but when I do, it's going to have an emotional strain on my heart because Aaron was just such a wonderful, wonderful guy. This is this this is this is weird. You're gonna think this is a weird thing to say, but I looked I, when I was watching it. There were scenes where they did close ups of of Nog, and I was and I always try to see if I can see any of the lines of the makeup that that these characters are wearing. Just something yeah. I do for some reason, and they do a great job with his prosthetics. But I was also thinking to myself of not picturing Nog, but I was picturing Aaron. And I was picturing Aaron in his hat that he always wore when he wore conventions. And that made me think of what I have said over and over and over again on the show is the people are at these conventions to meet the fans. And I would never go up to them. Aaron is a perfect example. He and Renee are two of the ones that I always think of the most. Because whenever I went up to the table, it always looked like they were busy doing something and I didn't want to bother them. That will always bother me because I didn't do it with Aaron and I didn't do it with Renee. And now I never can. So I think of these things when I see scenes like this with the close-ups of Nog when he was when he was spilling his guts to to Vic was I was thinking of specifically that 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 particular uh yeah. that particular instance. I can guarantee you'll never do that again. Yeah. I um, won't. No, nope, absolutely not. It's going to be hard to keep you in the booth at Mission Chicago <laughs> because you're going to be all over the place going, "Oh my god, I want to go see <laughs> exactly. Anthony Rapp." You know, <laughs> I want to go say hi. You know, he'll be, come or, on, he'll, what are you talking about? He'll want to come see us, man. That's that's actually <laughs> true. At, at Vegas, you're going to be all over the dealer's room going, oh yep. my God, I just want to give them a hug. <laughs> exactly. yeah, you got that right. <laughs> yep. So anyway. Well, well buddy, it, it is only a paper moon. And you know, yep. the only thing I can hope that this episode does for people is get them to listen to some of these old standard songs. Yes. That I've listened to my whole life. I mean- yeah, there are artists out there who still record them today. People like Michael Bublé, who I have a, a vast affection for. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, Michael Bublé does a great version of I've Got the World on a String. That's one of my favorites. Awesome. Um, but the arrangements and the the orchestra, they are just amazing. And I hope that that, as, as a good part of this, I hope that people rediscover some of that music because it's as timeless, you know, as Star Trek is, quite frankly. It, it really is. The other thing that I want people to to think about when they listen to this episode as we talk about this amazing Deep Space Nine episode is we had a lot of we we threw a lot of humor into the into our discussion about it. A lot of things that we like and we laugh a lot. This is an extremely emotional and powerful episode. Yeah. It's got a lot of tenseness. It's got a lot of sadness. It's got a lot of hope at the same time though. So we do our thing when we're talking on Trek Geeks, but this episode means a lot uh, to me, and I know it does to yeah, you as well. It does. Um, and just because we're 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 laughing about certain aspects of it doesn't mean that we take anything away from the underlying message of this of this episode, which is the intense pressure and and stress that people going through post traumatic stress can have. Absolutely. You know, it goes back to, I'm reminded of the words that my mom used to say to me as a kid. And, and she would tell me, you know, I have to find a way to laugh because if I don't, I'll never stop crying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, thinking about this episode, it would be real. I'm starting to get emotional now just thinking about it. You know, to think about the fact that Aaron is gone and what Nog has been through on this journey. Mm -hmm. If I don't find a reason to sort of lighten it up in my own mind and to enjoy some of the other aspects this episode will devastate me every time, and I just Absolutely. I don't want that to happen. Yeah, I, I I think of you know to try to to, to lighten the load. I th- I think I, I think of that cane that that Vic gave Nog, and just think what it would be like <laughs> to wrap you over the head with it. That's oh. what makes me happy. 
So well, at least you didn't want to try to set me on fire. <laughs> I, you didn't let me finish. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just kidding, man. <laughs> That's, I love how he gives him a replica of Errol Flynn's cane. I'm like, great. Pick a Nazi sympathizer. <laughs> And give him that guy's, you know, replica yeah. of that guy's cane. That that's brilliant, quite frankly. <laughs> of course, I, it did look like the Grand Nagus too, which I thought was quite funny. It really yeah, did. <laughs> it really did, and I, I'm sure that's the reason why he did it. <laughs> yeah. Because maybe it it unlocks something in Nog's mind for his inner Ferengi, you know. There you go. And yep. Nog identifies it right away. He does. Yep. Like, he hey, does. that reminds me of the Grand Nagus. Boom. There's a t- there's a tie back to reality. Exactly. Yeah. So see, computer slash Vic is always always thinking, always doing what's best. It's doing more than we are, that's for uh, sure. I have no idea how to think. Well, buddy, you know it wouldn't be an episode of Trek Geeks if we didn't take a moment here to stop and show some real thanks to our friends, the band Five Year Mission, uh, who let us use their music yes. every single episode. I mean, since the start of this show, we have used their music and and it's been nothing short of amazing. We love them. We want you all to become big fans of Five Year Mission, like so many of you have over the last seven years. So please head on out to fiveyearmission.net, get all their CDs sent to your door because we swear you were gonna love their original songs based on Star Trek episodes. It's not parody, it's not making fun mm-hmm. of Star Trek. These are brand new ways to look at these episodes we've loved all of our lives, Dan. Fiveyearmission.net. Awesome, awesome music. Go get all their CDs. And like we've talked about before, buy the CDs. Don't do the digital stuff. Buy the actual media. It's worth it. Um, you know what else is worth it, Bill? Is watching Your face? That's all. That goes without saying. But this one's great. I, I, it's just great. So this dude lies and brags <laughs> about killing... <laughs> <laughs> is it great? It's great. Uh, so this dude lies and brags about killing a Klingon named Kozak while they're on tour, and he's then forced to marry his widow Grilka. And in a wild attempt for Grilka not to lose her fortunes to her family's mortal enemy, they have this weird thing that happens. But once the truth all comes out, the dude is forced to battle to the death with nothing but drumsticks in front of the whole Klingon High Council. The question is, will Galron intervene check it out it's deep space nine it's the house of fark and you're gonna love it just like you love this spark yeah. <laughs> i love is strong <laughs> love is strong I mean, this I, one i feel like i'm speed dating this episode and i'm about to tap out <laughs> uh but it wasn't bad yeah. though I, I didn't i didn't get i got that from you it was it was a better oh, it certainly one. wasn't it certainly wasn't good <laughs> House of Fark. It's a good one. Grilka's awesome. Love Grilka. She comes back later uh, when the House of Fark is having an addition put on. Maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? I don't about even have any idea. Put on. <laughs> Just do me a favor. Shut up. Okay. Fiveyearmission.net. Um, please Just ignore Dan's Farkism and go get your CDs. That's really all we care about. Get the CDs. Of course, don't forget, you can support the Trek Geeks Podcast Network by subscribing to us on Patreon. Dan, where people can get all kinds of raw audio from our episodes and and perkification and, well, um, stuff. Stuff. And I'll tell you, the raw audio, it's worth its weight in gold right there when you listen to these two jokers, right? Like you and me looking at the computer screen. Anyway, uh, right now we want to take a moment to thank our associate producers for Trek Geeks. We are so grateful for their support. And they are Vikram Bhatt, Brad DeMag, William Edward M. Jr., Patrick Escudero, Andy Fark, Kimberly Francis, Jonathan Hamilton, Peter Hong, William Jackson, Ryan Jeffs, John Krikorian, Sean Lynn, Rick Mason, Jamie McGregor, Ross McKinney, Aaron Molenkoff, Casey Pettit, Helen Reed, Sarah Rutlinger, Tim Robertson, Greg Rozier, Eric Sakian, Adam Sanders, Tim Serdar, Heather Sohn, Blake Strike, Rick Tatro, Lisa Tomlinson, Ron Robel, and the gracious and wonderful Connie Hutchins. You know, the best part is, is you messed up a name and I wasn't even doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Not like last time. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> we also want to thank our Trek Geeks producers for their support. They are Mike Bovia. Ugh, cripe. Chaz Bradshaw, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Andy Davenport, Craig Ewing, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Lionel Marchon, Matt McGonagall, Jim McMahon, Darren Metcalf, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Jamie Rogers, Aye. Major Self, Casey Shafsky, Jim Stoffel, Chris Trebuzio, Ken Tripp, Christina Werther, and the lovely and talented Jess Vashon. Dan, the senior producer of Trek Geeks, is the forever fabulous Jude Tatman. Ferengi forever fabulous Jude Tatman. 
I don't think he's a Ferengi. I think he's just a normal kid, dude. Oh. Well, you too can become a producer on the Trek Geeks Network, and it is so easy to do. Just head on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks for all the details. Dan, you know, in a couple of weeks, yeah. uh, let's talk about some Star Trek news. We haven't done that in a long, long time, so that's all we're going to do. A, a long, long time. You got that right. Uh, you know, new shows, new movies, new toys, new games, new trailers, new everything. I mean, it seems like there's been a new Star Trek news story just about every day recently. So next time, we're going to give you a full episode of the biggest stories in the Trek universe. It's Newsapalooza Trek style, and it's coming next time on Trek Geeks, the flagship of the Trek Geeks podcast network. I can't wait to see how you come up with a cover for this one. It's, it's, it's going to be a big newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you haven't read a newspaper in your life, mainly because you don't know how to read, I don't read. which you've proven right. time and again <laughs> on this podcast. You know, for more great Star Trek discussion, we want everyone to check out the other member podcasts here on the network. We have so many wonderful shows, all created by passionate fans who just want to celebrate Star Trek and Gene's vision. You can find all our podcasts in the free Trek Geeks mobile app for iOS or Android. Or get a link to your favorite podcast player by visiting trekgeeks.com slash listen. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network. No one talks Trek like we do. No one. Of course, for all the news on all the Star Treks, yo, please visit our great friends at treknews.net. For now, this has been episode number 278 of the Trek Geeks Podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. Celebrate it with some coconut there, pally. I will celebrate nothing. Music for Trek Geeks is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Trek Geeks is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Bing bong. I feel like I'm at church. <laughs> Welcome to the Church of Trek Geek. Oh, I think we did the Halo bong. theme. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I never played Halo. Do you know that? Dude, it's been out for 20 years. I know. I never, I never, I tried the first one and I just, I just didn't get into it. I just, I think it's because of like the way that the view was. I don't know. I'm heavy into Call of Duty Vanguard not right now, though. I bought that last week. I still love to play the original Halo. Um, Never played it. That was actually... I actually bought an Xbox 20 years ago, the, the Generation 1 Xbox, yeah. um, just to play Halo. And I've had an Xbox... Ever since. Ever since. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I went to, as you know, the little story for the for the Patreonicals and for the people who are listening at the end of the show, I, um, I bought Call of Duty the last one world it's uh cold war part two or something like that hmm. at best buy just a couple weeks ago it was on sale i'm like oh my god the new call of duty is this cheap i'm gonna get it so i got it and i put it in my drive and i'm installing it and yeah i'm all excited and i'm like huh this opening sequence looks really familiar damn it i already <laughs> own this game oh man <laughs> so, i didn't realize yeah so i say so i go to you i go dude i got a copy of call of duty Cold War Zone, whatever it's called, Part 2. You want it? And you're like, yeah, but you have the new Xbox that doesn't have a disk drive. <laughs> it does not. Which, so, I, I mean, I'm okay with because every time you put a disk in, you got to download yeah. two gigs worth of updates yeah. anyway. So so if anybody wants uh, the Call of Duty, Cold War, whatever, I got a free copy just sitting around. <laughs> I remember playing the original Call of Duty games, which were all World War II based games. Yeah. 
yeah. on my original Xbox, by the way. Yeah. Um, and I loved those games. As soon as they good. started getting into Modern Warfare and the other ones, they kind of lost me a little bit. Yeah. Because it was just a little too intensive. I'll tell you what. I loved the... I think it was the original Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Modern Warfare. Modern Warfare. That one was good. And then they came out with the Call of Duty that took place in World War II that when I was shocked to all hell when Jack Bauer was doing the voiceover, Kiefer yeah. Sutherland, that yeah. was pretty amazing. I'll tell you what, though. These games are complicated. You got like seven or eight different tabs you can go to to do your weapons. And it, yeah. it, it can take you an hour just to get like a patch on your rifle. Don't want that. <laughs> it's just a little crazy. I'm having it's fun it. with it, though. <laughs> Even from the original Call of Duty games, every now and then I would still go around saying, Mark Schnell! Mark Schnell! <laughs> because it seems like all the all the AI Germans in the game yeah. you know, would, would scream that, obviously. Um, I, I tried to play that game that, uh, that Sid was heavy into a couple years ago when we talked to him. Um, oh yeah, I forget the name of it. Uh, uh yeah, uh, Elden, the division no. is that what it was? Yeah, I can't remember what it is. Uh, it I didn't make it past the first level. It is hard. Okay, well he's a lot um, smarter than you are. So well, that's really not a surprise. He's genetically engineered. <laughs> that was the character, Bill. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh well, Sid is just he's smart and he's beautiful. He is. He is. So. I got to say, this this new game, I've been playing it every night for the last few weeks. Who reads next to me? And I just play my game. And it's cool. I th- I think I got to check. And if anybody knows the answer to this, let us know. I think Idris Elba is the voice character in the game. And one of the guys who plays one of the head Nazis, the, the computer generated face, he looks just like the actor who played Charlie and Lost. I'm trying to. I gotta. I gotta do some searching and see who's doing these games. These games. You could look at the IMDb for that game. I, I just haven't. I haven't done it because I just haven't had the time. But uh, I want to find that out because Sue actually looked up last night and said, "Is that interest?" Oh, I said, "Yeah, I, I really think it is." So I'm gonna have to check. <laughs> <laughs> you mean Charles Minor? Yeah, yeah. That's an Office reference. I, 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 I'm, I'm going with it. Interest Elba turns up in the Office. He does. Yes, he's what in season? a. Uh, season four, I think it is. Oh, okay. Either four or five. Um, when Michael decides to start the Michael Scott Paper Company. <laughs> oh my God. He's okay. in like three or four episodes. I'm- he plays the replacement, uh, or he, he, he becomes Michael's boss. Um, and um, he and Michael don't really see eye to eye, so Michael quits. <laughs> his own company? Well, no, he quits Dunder Mifflin. Oh, Dunder Mifflin, okay. To start his own paper company. And gotcha. that's, that's really not spoilerish. No, that's fine. I knew he uh, left anyway yep. at some point. Yeah. So obviously he comes back. Yeah. That's, that's not a spoiler either. That's funny. Um, but Idris Elba, it's weird to hear him with an Americanized accent. Oh, yeah. That'll be very interesting. But okay. he's Idris Elba. Yeah. At one point, there's a cutaway shot. And, you know, they have those those directs to the camera <laughs> where you know, they're, they're like they're being interviewed for a documentary. And he says, yes, I am aware of the effect I have on women. <laughs> <laughs> because the women in the office are like, ooh, Charles Minor. He's yeah. Dre- yeah. Man, he is dreamy. And let's face it, Andrew Elba is a beautiful guy. He is I mean, dreamy. Even as what's his name and beyond, he was a little dreamy. As a... Uh, no, his, uh, his human character. I can never remember his name. It was an interesting name. I forget. Oh, Balthazar Edison. Balthazar. I love that name. That's a cool name. I want my next... If I ever get a male dog, I want that to be his name. Balthazar. We decided that if we ever get a male dog, we're going to name him Jimothy, which is an office reference. Oh, okay. I'm not a big... Uh, we've had... I've had female dogs my entire life, so we're just going to stick with it. Um, I, I've had male dogs growing up, and uh, Abby and now Isabella... Or the only female dogs I've ever had, and um, I They're just awesome. yeah, they are. Our, well, and, dogs are awesome anyway. But our next dog, we have already decided on a name for our next dog, and so oh. even like this one. What is it? Tilly. I like that a little discovery reference there. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's what it's going to be. <laughs> How do you really feel? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! <laughs> so here we are. Um, mm-hmm. Thirty days. Thirty days out. Thirty days of How you night. Feeling? I'm feeling great. What do you mean thirty days of thirty night? days? Did you ever see that movie? That's it's another. No? Just these things come flying at y'all from all directions when we're doing the outtake, man. It's a good. Uh, it's a good horror movie. Vampire horror movie. Vampires in Alaska when the sun goes down for thirty days. That'll be a nice vacation, won't it? Oh yes, very. Another reason to hate winter. Pretty violent too. 
And it, it, it's it's real violence because the blood is like black instead of red. So yeah. Hold on for one second. I need to listen to a voicemail from my wife. Okay. She sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher right now, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If you can hear her in the background, because I can hear her a little bit as uh, as uh, as we record this here uh, outtake. So, yeah, there we go. You know, I was just going to create an edit point, but since you were an idiot and did oh, that, I'm okay. going to leave it in. Yeah, might as well. What idiot? I was I was filling in. We don't like dead air on the podcast, right? Dude, it's 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 called an outtake, which means I you know, can edit it out. It's also called improvisational skills, yo. Right. When do those happen? <laughs> <laughs> Dead Air Davidson. <laughs> that hasn't happened in at least two episodes. <laughs> we actually have more time than I thought because she decided she was going to go to the gym. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. Dead Air Dan David. So yeah, thirty days. Mm-hmm. Um, very excited. I'm excited. I'm I'm nervous. Mm-hmm. I haven't been around people in two years. I know. This coming Sunday, as we record this, will be my t- be two years that I've been at home. Yep. Yeah. The anniversary of working from home started the thirteenth. Yeah. Yeah. Which is coming up. It it's weird to think that we're going to be around people. I'm th- I'm looking forward to it though. I think it'll be all right. I am. Yep. It's just it's I've gotten so used to I don't want to say being a shut in because I'm not a shut in. I mean we go out. Yeah. But I haven't traveled. I haven't traveled since we went to Hollywood for the Picard premiere. No. Um, Not at Disney. That's about it. And I haven't haven't been on a plane. I haven't done any of that stuff. It's interesting because, you know, this, you know, you still have concerns about what's going on, but I've been, wa- I was watching a couple of award shows, the, the awesome awards the other night. I watched some video with the Akutas when they got their lifetime achievement award, which was awesome. Yeah. And then the SAG awards were on TBS last weekend and seeing people ag- again together and celebrating and hugging with these awards. It was, it was kind of nice to see. So, you know, it'll be good to, uh, it'll be good to be, uh, to seeing our Star Trek family here in 30 days time. I think it'd be great. Mind blowing, isn't it? It'd be great. Can't wait. <laughs> I got Remember a surprise last, too. For whom? For well, it's it's going to be for me, but it's something that you haven't seen yet, which I'll be bringing with me. <laughs> now I'm, my my curiosity is peaked. Well, it's going to peak. It's going to be continuing that climb until thirty days time, and then you see it. I'm not going to find out ahead of time. No, why not? Why would I do that to you? So, at what point in the trip do I find out? When I show it to you, when we get to Chicago. Oh, so when we get to Chicago, it's not like yes. at the airport it's in just, Manchester? It, I, I can tell you. I decided to, you know how I have the Picard uniform? Mm. I decided, you know what? I want to really have one with a gold braid on it, so I got one. <laughs> I wasn't going to sew it myself. That's stupid. So I just got one. It hasn't come now in yet, so just, hopefully it's not like this big. Not when you can just go on eBay and, <laughs> exactly. and order one. But I'll tell you what, the day I find the outfit that Q wears in episode one, and two of Picard, I will be putting down some cake for that because I want that outfit like you would not even believe. <laughs> so is is there an alternate future where Q has decided to shave his head? No, I'm you know what? If I decide if I find this uniform, I will grow my hair out and 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 dye it white. Cause I got the I got the I almost a perfect goatee for it. So yeah, I'll do it. I will definitely do it, man. If I can find that uniform, because it is so awesome. The black coat with the ascot and the pointy thing in the back. Oh, yeah. I de- I'll do it. And the little turtle brooch. I don't know what it is, but that's what I'm calling it. The <laughs> The idea that you would grow your hair out is is just mind-blowing to me. If I can. Um, what? what I, I've got so many questions. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't have to grow out much. He doesn't have a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> He's got infinitely more than you do. Sorry, John, but you don't have a lot of hair. But if I have to get a wig, I'll get a wig. <laughs> oh, God, I, I want to do this so on a level like like this is like it's it's much simpler, but this is on a level of me wanting to do this is Galt. I just love the way okay. he looks in this. Yeah. So uh, jumping forward to Vegas, hmm. um, are, are, is Guy Fieri going to make an appearance in Vegas this year? Why wouldn't he? I don't know. We're different location. We're gonna be a different hotel. Guy Fieri is everywhere. That's true. Mm-hmm. He's that's in co- he's in Bud Light seltzer commercials now. Well, which is amazing because that's not really <laughs> great for you know either. 
<laughs> um, his food's not great. It makes sense he'd appear in a Budweiser commercial for right. seltzer. Why does Budweiser bother even calling it Budweiser? Because it's really just water. It is. I don't like I don't Budweiser. Have, I don't have any idea. I'm not. I'm. And even though Guy is in those commercials, I'm pretty sure I will not try those. I'm really not too interested in them. So if they have one. That is a a lime, coconut, mango, passion fruit. Um, I know you're going to be down for it. I'm not a a can of coconut polar seltzer. Coconut polar. Yeah, uh, it's awesome. It's coconut limeade, actually. Um, I'm not a huge passion fruit and or mango flavor in seltzers, however. I love mango with fruit, but in the seltzers, I'm not a big fan, which sucks because all of the variety packs always include mango. I was just naming four flavors that ought not go together in one can. Ought not go together? Ought not. I love that phrase. Yeah. Yeah. And But you would buy it. <laughs> and you would try it at least once, as you said many times on this podcast. I would. I, as I did with the um, sweater pack Budweiser seltzers over the fall. And they had, fl- they had like a maple pear and they had a pumpkin spice seltzer. They had a, was it buttered popcorn? I forget what the third one was. It was some weird thing. But yeah. Urine? I'll try- <laughs> that was actually, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I am sorry to our listeners for enduring that. I, I, just, <sighs> I was, I reacted. You did. I own it. You do. That's all right. I own it. But yes, this coconut limeade is very good. I recommend it highly. Yeah, no. No, thanks. <sighs> that was gross. Sorry. <laughs> it's, anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I I guess we're going to do this. I'll be seeing you in all those familiar places. <laughs> Don't sing. Sorry, I won't. I would. I would never. Are we done? No. Okay. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm trying to create a pause. Oh. Oh my god, shut the f*** up. <laughs> Coconut! <laughs>